Wow, thank you so much, Chris and Jillian. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, age assurance, age verification, something that was tackled, tackled, addressed in the COPA Commission, the Child Online Protection Act of 2000, 22 years ago, which I sat on. And here we are still struggling with this, but it's a hard problem. I do feel though a little bit more optimistic that we might be getting to a place where public policy and technology and awareness has risen enough uh, for us to finally make this a reality. So um, the next uh, group coming up on stage um, is uh, an excellent panel to take us uh, to discuss in more detail uh, what we've just seen and heard. Um, the moderator for this is an old friend of mine and of Fozzi's. He is a technology policy lawyer, a consumer privacy advocate, and an ultra premium bourbon startup founder. If you don't believe me, look him up on LinkedIn. Uh, he has done stints at the ACLU, Facebook, and the App Developers Alliance, and for the past 11 years has run his own government rela relations consultancy and mostly kept me sane. Please join me in welcoming Tim Sparapani and our panelists. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'd like to add my welcome to that of Stephen. Um, it's a little early to talk about bourbon, so let's talk about, um, <laughs> unless you'd rather, I mean, I'd be happy to switch subjects, but uh, let's talk about kids uh, and um, this fabulous bit of research. I want to add my thanks uh, to that of Stephen and Fossey for Google and its sponsorship of the research and to Kantar for really giving us such incredibly rich deep research into areas that we have wanted to know some answers about for so very long. This is really important stuff, um, Chris, so thank you for doing the work that you've done. Really, I think you've, you've found some really important nuance and insight. Um, we've got about 45 minutes. We're gonna get a chance to talk about this. We're gonna do about 30 minutes here on stage um, where I've got some of the best experts out there to help elucidate the research that we have just been talking about and give their um, insights and reactions to that research. And then we're gonna have about 15 minutes at the end for all of you to ask some questions uh, of the panel. And um, I think it'll be a, a good 45 minutes. So that's what we're planning on doing. So let's dive right in. Um, I wanna begin right now by asking uh, my two panel, well, first of all, I wanna begin the two uh, uh, panelists who haven't had a chance yet to introduce themselves to give you uh, some bit of introduction of themselves and their expertise. I want to begin with Julie and then to Almadena. Julie, why don't you give us just a, a brief introduction about you and Yoti, and then we'll of course go to Almadena. I think people know a little bit about Google, but we'll want to hear about you and your role in a minute. So Julie, please. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, so Julie Dawson, I'm Chief Policy and Regulatory Officer, what a tongue twister, eh? Um, at Yoti, which is a digital identity and age platform. So helping people prove who they are or how old they are either face-to-face -face or online. And today, in the topic of age assurance, is one that we've been focused on probably for about six years, and specifically looking also at newer methods where people aren't using hard identifiers. Um, so specifically championing one approach around the use of facial age estimation. And I take part in a number of standards bodies. Some um, might if you pick up also with Ian Corby from the Age Verification Providers Association, part of the membership body where we are driving forward the standards, international standards for age assurance. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Welcome. Almudena, please. Yes, I'm Almudena Lara. Um, Stephen was trying to find me in the room before I was actually back uh, backstage. Uh, I've been working with FOSI and Kantar through this research. I lead uh, pu children's public policy for Google. And uh, as you say, I'm not going to tell you what Google is or Google does, but just to remind you as well that uh, we actually have a big family of products that are specific for children, but also many, many other products that benefit children like YouTube, Search, Play. Um, Play Store, etc. So very keen to explore today with all of you how this research can help us in our commitment to ensure that children get better and safer experiences. Great. Um, as you can see, we've got some of the world's experts up here on stage. Um, first question is going to go to both Amadena and then to Julie. 
and then to Chris with a reaction to their comments. I'd love to hear, as someone who was in the room that Stephen was talking about back in 1998, yes, I'm that old, um, I know, you're shocked, um, where the original COPPA was written, uh, and, and as someone who has really tried to help get this right, since 1996 and in preparation for 1998 when COPPA was written here in the United States, um, your reaction to this research, because we're still struggling, I think, to find, this is my reaction, to, to get this right. And I think the research talks about this. And I think you, you see these uh, differing attitudes across three different countries. Um, so maybe, Almadena, maybe you could give your reactions. What surprised you? What caught your attention yeah. from the research? And then, Julie, you're next, please. Yeah, so first, I, I want to say and extend my thank you to Fossi and Kantar for the research. It, Sounds like it was yesterday. We were back in June in London in a much warmer day when we announced this research. And uh, they have done a fantastic job over three countries with many, many parents and trying to make sense of all the very rich data points that are coming out from, from the survey. So my three top reflections from, from this is the first and the obvious one that this is very complex space. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've done a fantastic job trying to make it less complex for all of us. But I think this is something that we all need to grapple with. The fact that uh, this is very complex, parents have different views to children, have different views across different jurisdictions, have probably very different views within a country as, as massive as, as the US. So that, that complexity is something that over the years we, we just need to grapple with. My second reflection was I, I was really taken aback by how much parents want to be part of the online experience of their children. And obviously there might be an issue about the parents that we have surveyed are particularly engaged, but it actually being able to, to garnish that interest mm. from parents into being part of the, of the solution and the digital lives of their children, bearing into account as well the that we also need to think about children and allowing children to, to grow and develop by themselves. And my third one, I think it was a subtle thing coming out of the report, but I think it's very important, which is how children and families are framing the question about age assurances. And they seem to be thinking about it as restrictions rather than about giving them positive, safer, more age-appropriate experiences. And I think I'm keen for us to explore that as well a bit more, because my hope is that this is not about restricting access and restricting opportunities to children, but actually about ensuring that they have better and safer experiences. Julie, what, what really stood out to you in the research? What, what caught your attention? Uh, did you see things that you expected? Did it confirm your Viewpoints. So there were some really startling elements for me. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting the number of hours that parents were asserting that they actually spent doing this. It made me feel quite um, inadequate as a parent, I must say. I thought I'm either... Hold, hold on. I, um, <laughs> show of hands here. Let's be honest. How many of you spend 11 hours monitoring your children's use online? I, I, I mean, I'm, I have a 10 and a half year old. I, I don't have that much time, and I, I'm deeply concerned about what she does online. It, it, please, I'd love to hear if anybody does 10 and a half hours. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I felt I was much more with the French so end of the spectrum. <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> respect to the parents who have time for that. I really appreciate yeah. it, but um, yeah. please, Julie. Yeah, no, it was extraordinary. So that was one thing that really stood out to me. And was it that people were thinking, this is what I ought to be doing, and this is so confusing, or, or, or this is what I think I should be doing. I, I don't know, I was, I was quite intrigued by that. I think the fact that there was no one silver bullet in terms of method brings back that element that there has to be choice for parents. Different people in different contexts will want different options. So as an industry of age verification providers, we need to provide that choice. I did wonder what we would learn if we did this research across more countries. Would there be even more sort of disparity? Um, and then the final point was just around this element of, of use of biometrics. Um, I was on the one hand 
encouraged that people were looking beyond the initial sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt of actually using anything at all to do with a face and understanding that something can be just looking, assessing, deleting and so no unique recognition. And yet I don't know whether that was what was in people's minds. So there's always other questions that afterwards you, you want to ask to more parents in more areas. But hats off to you guys. I think there was a huge amount that you did in, in laying the ground. And, and it was quite genius, I think, to look at such different countries. So thank you. Chris, you got so deep into the research. Yeah. What did you hear from your co-panelists here that you want to respond to? Oh, I think, I mean, firstly, the complexity that I think you both have touched on, it really does, I think, it reinforces the fact that we cannot, no one group can do this alone, right? This is not just a technical fix. This is not just about setting policy rules, right? This is about how do we come together to, <laughs> to figure out what the solution is, right? You, you talked about, we've been looking at this issue and how to, how to provide safe online spaces for a couple decades now, right? And so, you know, the, the easy uh, answers come, you know, to questions like this from a single organization or a single solution. We're not going to find that here. So I think that's the first thing that I would respond to around the complexity. Um, I, I think also that I was startled by the hours spent. Um, and so I think, you know, to me, this just says parents, whether that's aspirational or whether that's true reporting, there's this is a heavy topic for parents, right? And so whatever the real you know, story is per family, we need to lighten the load for them. And we need to figure out ways to make this not have to be such a heavy task. Thank you. So let's, let's pick up right there. Whose responsibility is it then to lighten that load? To, to whom do we turn? Is it, do we, do we ask the parents to do more? Do we ask kids to do more? Is it? Governments? Is it companies? What, what do we think? Um, I'm happy to have a first go at this. Please. Um, so I think it's always said in the world of child safety that it takes a village to keep a child safe. And it's a very topical, but I think it is, it is true here as well. I think that uh, parents obviously want to be involved, but to be involved in, a, in an effective way, they also need to be supported by mm. industry and by technology. So having the right tools to be able to do it. So um, parental controls or parental tools like Google has Family Link available for, for parents, but uh, continuing to iterate those tools and listening to kids and families to see how we can design them in a way that actually helps them with, with their objective. I think education plays a, a great role, educating parents. Not all parents feel, I, I think a lot of the hours that uh, people claim to be spending, I think it's probably more hours worrying yes. about the issue yes. rather than hours actually doing something effectively about it. So how can we support them to actually use less time in a more effective way that actually supports their children? How can we empower them to have better conversations with their children about child safety? I think children also have and want to play a role. I think that that also came strongly in the research, that they feel that they, they are not being brought into the conversation about uh, safety. They want to take an active part as well. And this absolutely doesn't mean that uh, we need to put the responsibility on children to keep themselves safe. Absolutely not. But we also need to be able to give them agency and empower them to make decisions for themselves and to, and to feel safe and to feel safe to actually seek help from others. So I think um, speaking here from industry, I think industry has a big, play, uh, a big role to play in offering better, safer experiences that children actually want to be in rather than uh, experiences that are maybe not so attractive and they try to also bypass the, right. the safety right. controls. And as I say, empowering parents and children to also make the best decisions. Yeah, Chris and Julie, I'm going to come right back the same question to both of you in just a second. Okay, again, show of hands for the parents in the room. How many of you have spent between three and 12 hours talking to your significant other about the concerns about your children being online in a week? 
Um, I, I, that's a common topic in our house. So that number rings true with me. I think that the, the, maybe if we're measuring how much angst or agita mm -hmm. um, we're all feeling about it, maybe that's yeah. the number that's really being measured. And maybe also engaging, yeah. right? So monitoring, not in the fact that I'm checking an app to see what they've done, but I'm monitoring, I'm maybe using a site with a younger child. So there, you know, I think monitoring can be in interpreted in a couple sure. different ways. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think to follow up, uh, Amadeno, what you were saying, I think we never should underestimate the importance of bringing children into this conversation. And I think, you know, the default answer would be to say, yes, as they get older, we should do that. But I think as parents, we often underestimate our younger children as mm -hmm. well and the way that they could contribute uh, and the things that they could learn at a young age about this. So I would just, I mean, follow up on that point mm -hmm. to say, like, it's not just about tweens and teens. There have to be ways, we have to be smart enough to find ways to bring them into the conversation right away. Mm -hmm. right. Julie, please. I would concur with a lot of that. I think, however, we also have to look at those children who don't have that supportive mm -hmm. background. And for all those parents that do want to play that role, that is wonderful and we welcome that, but we all know that they can't do it literally 24 seven or on the bus or at someone else's house yeah. or in other different contexts. So we, that's why of any of those demographics, the burden shouldn't fall so, solely on the child. So I'm sure in this room, there's probably a whole range of different stakeholders from nonprofits, NGOs, from government, from regulators, from the privacy side. We need to also look at accessibility bodies, looking at people that are looking at um, young people with different disabilities, children in care. There's a whole range of different contexts whereby children might not have that support. And I think that's why we have a, a shared responsibility to, to cast on it as wide as we can in that education and support piece to let them thrive rather than just think of only the safety. We need that communal effort. And I, I love mm -hmm. your village analogy. I'm going to shift to, I want to shift directions just a little bit here between something else that really popped off the page for me as a reader, uh, really a tension between efficacy of age assurance methodologies and ease of use mm -hmm. and the need that it seemed to, that both parents and regulators, but really respondents from all ages of, to the surveys, mm -hmm. so, sort of uh, articulated that they mm -hmm. wanted really the blessed happy medium between the two. How do, we, how do we hit that mark? Are we hitting that mark? What sort of technologies are you hopeful about? Um, excited about anyone who on the panel who wants to take that. Sure. Julie, so do you I want to go first? Please? Yeah, there's, jump a, in. there's a lot of evolution in this area. Um, and, and clearly methods that were working and that have been in, in place for a long time are still still with us. But, but give, give us evolution. some examples. Um, so people putting in a date of birth, people asserting that they're a certain age. But I think what's changed in the last two, three, four years is a range of wider methods. And that, I think, is, is one of the things that, that people are intrigued to find out more about. Government, regulators, NGOs, privacy bodies, parents, and young people. So actually explaining what those new methods are, um, be it looking at some of the different approaches around an age estimation, be it looking at some of the different behavioral elements, um, that's where a lot of research is being done today. And in the international standards bodies, we're having to look at what is the time and cost for somebody to circumvent a method? Uh, and that will change over the next mm -hmm. few years as more methods evolve. Is it, is it getting easier? Is it getting harder? Uh, Chris, Almadena, please respond. Where are we with this? Efficacy, ease of use, what, what, what's happening? I, I think it is a fascinating equation yeah. there. And I would add as well <coughs> to that, it's the, the amount of data collected and processed that it mm -hmm. also need to be uh, brought into into the equation to to be able to establish what are the right methods for the right use, and I think that that is something that I would also want to emphasize that that is the point of proportionality. So different methods we, m might be very difficult to to engage with, or might be cumbersome, require quite a lot of data, like a government ID, but might be appropriate for certain uses if that activity is considered particularly risky, whilst for other type of activities that would be disproportionate. So I think uh, this, this concept of proportionality 
is, is key as we speak. But the trade, the, I think I agree with Julie, as technology evolves, mm -hmm. things will be, the things that today seem hard and cumbersome in a year's time might be much easier. In a year's time might require less data to actually uh, get, get to a, a relatively accurate uh, uh, estimation of the age. And I think that that concept of estimation of the age versus absolute verification is also important to bear in mind because it will vary depending on, on the user case that we, we make. Chris, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, if I'm thinking of what we gathered both in the qualitative and the quantitative work, it seems to me that when there is a clear tie to the, the application that's being used, you know, people are a little more forgiving. But people start to say like, okay, well, why do you need my financial information so my kid can use this yeah. app, right? So I think that distance between <coughs> the use case and the information or the identifying data that's, that's underlying that I think becomes part of the tension. So I think the next kind of bit of research that would be really interesting is to put different use cases in front of parents and then say, what do you think is the effectiveness and the invasiveness for your child to use this versus that versus this service. Mm -hmm. So a good forward looking. I think that's yeah. really a really good point. And then the inclusion angle. So there will always be um, people that don't have access or don't, who don't own or don't have access. It could be that their parents have put their passport or their driving license in a different place or a controlling spouse. If we look on the planet, there's over a billion people that don't have no ID. a government yeah. um, ID document with any security features. So going forwards, how do we enable people societally to participate? So yeah. it's, it's really... And, uh, and building on that is, is, the, is choice. Yeah. Giving, giving people choice for, for choosing what might be appropriate for them in that particular circumstance. I, I wanted to also make the point that uh, amongst the methods of uh, age assurance, I think one of the ones that might be missing in the, re in the research is the use of behavioral data to estimate age. And I think that that is also a very interesting potential development when it comes to estimating the, the age of the user is one where Google is also uh, currently doing uh, age estimation based on uh, patterns of use to, to, to be able to tell us whether someone is likely to be over the age of 18 or under the age of 18. So added to other methods of mm. age assurance, I think it is another important development that we need to be looking into. I want to come back to this word proportionality, which I, I really love that you used. One of the things that really, I think, again, really popped for me as a reader of the report was this idea that there's a sliding scale over time of what people want in terms of efficacy and ease of use with different age groups um, uh, of kids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and mm -hmm. that, that, that scale is hard to hit, mm -hmm. like what's appropriate with various age blocks and in different contexts. But it, that seemed to be a theme that both kids picked up on and adults picked up on across all three of the mm -hmm. countries that were surveyed, where we had survey respondents. Can anyone respond to that? Is that, did, did you see that as well? What, what, do, we, what do we think of that? And, and more importantly, maybe, what does that mean for regulators who are trying to help guide this to the right spot? I'll, I'll let you, you both talk to the regulators piece, maybe. But I, I, yes, we definitely, I mean, that was something that we wanted to bring out that we definitely heard and saw <coughs> the data. I think one interesting piece of data that we haven't really talked about yet is that um, we asked parents whether monitoring and safeguarding their children's online activities is more important than their privacy. And in the US, 70%, and the UK too, 70% of parents said that versus about 46 in, in France. I think, again, this speaks to the French kind of a bit more of a hands-off method. And I think in the qualitative, we also heard them saying like, hey, I, I can't always be there, so I want my kids to, to learn on their own, right? And if they're gonna fail, 
have some problems, let's do it while I'm still here. And you know, so there's a bit of that. So I think it speaks to that idea that you're talking about of like that sliding scale over time, which I think we heard expressed maybe more robustly in the French. I mean, just picking up on one of your previous points there, Chris, you said that you know, if you were to look at a future piece of work, you might look at different instances for different use cases. One of the things that we find when we do research with companies is that there's a very different view from people that are actually doing something live prior their attitudes and post. Mm -hmm. So this element of experiential research is another one that I think is really quite interesting to actually do live research. Or if you think of the sandboxing that can take place in other sectors that's happened, say, in financial services, you actually have sort of live operations with companies whereby the regulators can actually see the actual results. And I think that's another, either the experiential or the sharing of data between companies that are doing proofs of concept to actually show what really happened in practice. Because a little bit like we saw with the parents, perhaps thinking they ought to be spending a lot of time, sometimes the, your, what you say and then actually what you do can be different. So I, I do think it's a yeah. really rich vein for us to tap into. So many things to react to, so <laughs> let, let, me, um, let me pick the point of privacy because I think that that is very interesting and I think often privacy is used in different ways. So I think the way that I interpret parents talking about privacy in this trade-off between safety and privacy is privacy vis-a-vis -vis my own within child, the family. so yeah. within the family. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think that that is important because often in the sector as well, when we talk about privacy, we talk about data privacy, so the data that gets collected and, pro and processes, processed and how that's done. And I think we, that, that's probably one area for further research and, and development. I think that it's also important when we are, you were talking about the efficacy and ease of use and how that changes over time. I think the, this specific research has been focusing on children and parents. I think it's also important that we extend the research to other users that are not parents, that are adults, and that will be affected by these, um, these requirements to verify the age. Maybe I'm going to say something obvious, but I think it is often missed in the conversation. That is that to verify the age of a child, you'll need to be able to verify the age of all users because to be able to say if a user is a child, you just need to um, ask everybody else. And I think that extending the research to, to cover that ground would be important. And I'm now back to your question about regulators. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to let you off the hook, so it's OK. So I had my note here. Yes, cool. go back to, to the question of regulators. I think that sometimes we talk of regulators as if they are monolithic and like what is the regulator going to say? I think the reality is that um, the same complexity that we have seen in the research applies to regulators and there are differences between regulators in France and in the US and in the UK and all over the world and even within jurisdictions there are differences. So we often might hear from uh, regulators looking at content safety and child safety to go one way, whilst then we hear from data pro protection authorities to go another way because they feel that actually some of the methods to uh, verify the age and restrict access might be too data restrictive. So even within a jurisdiction, regulators might feel very different about how this trade-off applies. The trade-offs will change, the trade-offs will evolve, but th there are those tensions as well that are playing out. Great. We are very close to the moment when you get to ask questions. Uh, there will be people running around with mics, uh, so get your questions ready. I'm gonna ask one last very quick question. Ask my panelists to respond very quickly. Panelists, very quickly. And then we're gonna take questions from the audience uh, from all of you. Um, so. Another thing that, again, there were so many things here that are so rich, caught my attention. What do we make of this really bizarre 
change in attitudes or difference in attitudes between how kids felt about anonymity online and how the adults who responded felt about anonymity online. Uh, the parents are privacy, 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 and the kids are like, yeah, kind of, <laughs> you know, it really doesn't matter as much. From what I read from the report, how, what do we, how do we account for this? Is, is it this generation? Is it their relative youth or lack of understanding of, of potential consequences? Yeah. Well, help me here. I mean, I think what, what children did say was more important than anonymity was the ability to manage their personal information online. So that active role seemed to be what they were after. Um, and I think I, I do chalk it up based on other things that Kantar has done and that we've seen that it does matter that there is no separation for this generation between the online and the offline, the real, the digital, in the way that still even, even maybe they're millennial parents, right? The oldest millennials are over 40 now, so even in the way that their oldest, uh, or that their, their millennial parents and Gen X parents, et cetera, may be viewing the world. Mm -hmm. Please, somebody, Julie? One of the nuances I think that's part of this whole education is explaining that you can just provide age and not the wider identity elements. So in some instances, when we've worked with young people, they've got the fact that all you're providing is an under 18, which we do, for example, for the NSPCC letter charge share an under 18 attribute, nothing more, even when that's coming from a document. Mm. And those sorts of nuance in education that it is possible just to provide an under 18 or over 18 or a 13 to 17 attribute and nothing more is passed to the organization. I think that's super important. And then the, the, So you think they're getting more sophisticated about the question in rather some than instances less. what we're finding. That's interesting. Okay, which please. is the, yeah. the flip. Yeah. yeah. And then that people will have blurred roles oh. so that the child might in some instances understand that they're only providing a certain amount of data. However, they might need to provide something that is linked to a hard identifier for setting up that bank account versus something that's an estimation in another context. And the child might not always under, understand that if they're buying a, a sort of, you know, a, a digital currency or something, they might need a different threshold. So there are some instances where they might have more knowledge and information and others where they maybe not be thinking of the repercussions such as with sexting images that's one that the child might not think further down the line what the bad ramifications mm. could be Amadena, quickly please yes quickly um so i also puzzled about how different uh, the different generations so the question about anonymity i wonder whether it has to do with their own experience or lack of experience about the value of anonymity an anonymous use of the internet. I think that depending on the service, it might be more or less important, but I mm. think for certain services to be able to access information, share information anonymously is key, and we need to make sure that in our quest to ensure that children have better and safer experiences online, we don't end up in a situation where either the reality is that we, we have to verify all our users, or if you are not verified, you have a very restricted experience and limited experience online, because there are very um, valid user cases from journalists, from marginalized and prosecuted, prosecuted uh, groups to be able to access uh, uh, online anonymously. So managing, managing that will be important as we go Thank forward. You. All right, question time. Um, can I have the hands up of the people with mics? And we've got two in the back. Uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. We'll, we'll have mics brought to you. Um, why, don't, why don't we start with the gentleman right here in the middle. If someone could bring this gentleman a microphone. Um, I think right here. It, uh, and please, if you'd stand up. And if you don't mind sharing uh, your name and affiliation, it would be great. So thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much to the panel for this amazing discussion. Um, I'm Mike. I'm the CEO of Modulate, a company doing voice moderation for online platforms. My question is around what the ultimate goal is here when we talk about age verification. I'm curious to hear, are we looking just for the binary of are they an adult or are they a kid? Are we looking for that extra level of, you know, some people mature at different rates and we want to be able to understand that, or does that get more invasive or more complicated in a way that we don't actually want to go that direction. I'm curious to hear kind of 
what does ultimate success look like in your minds to this age verification problem? Oh, there's a lot there. Who wants to take that? <laughs> um, Julie, I'm going to somebody, Chris, sure. somebody jump in. Go. So happy go. to. Um, so once you know that someone is a child, you can actually choose to treat them differently. And that, I think, is the essence of the age-appropriate design codes coming forwards that are coming up in different parts of the world. If I know this is a five-year-old, do I want them live streaming to 50-year-olds? Could I then turn off geolocation? Could I provide a different level of support, a different level of help? Could I put the language in, in, in a simpler way once I know that I'm dealing with a, a five, eight, ten-year-old versus an adult? And I think that wider age-appropriate experience, looking at the safety by design being built in once you know it's a child would be, would be my take. I, I agree with that. I think maybe what you are hinting is at the risk of then going one step further and trying to divide people into different groups and then actually how do you take into account the fact that children might mature in different ways um, and want to have access to different experiences. I think my, my hope and my desire is that uh, we are here doing all this, this very important work to make sure that children have better and safer experiences online and that actually that doesn't mean that we are restricting them from being able to enjoy the best that technology has to offer because I think that'll be a really sad outcome yeah. of, of this work. Uh, we need to be able to help them to enjoy education, access to information, having fun online in, in ways that are age appropriate. And that involves not only restricting them for their age, but also empowering children and parents to make the right decisions online. And that showed as well in the, in the research that actually parents want to have the ability to also override some of the decisions about age, and they do so, I do so as yeah, well. So I, I think <laughs> I that finding ahead. sort of reinforces that idea that parents already recognize that, okay, my 14-year-old is not the same person they were the day they turned 14, you know, 11 and a half months on. And, you know, I think at least some proportion of the folks who said they were making exceptions, overriding the rules on behalf of their children, which came out in the research, as you said, Amadana, at least some proportion of those folks are probably doing it saying, making that calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Saying, yes, my 14 year old is now uh, mature enough to do this day one of 14, maybe not, right? Great. Next question from over here, maybe. Uh, yes, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Melissa Mercado. I am with CDC. And I have a question. I'm a researcher, so my question is for Chris. It has to do with methodology. Um, certainly, what happens online has offline consequences. And I was also surprised about the very highly engaged parents in this sample for the quantitative survey. So I am wondering about social desirability bias, also wondering about diversity in the sample um, that was used in the different countries, mm. uh, thinking about differences in parents based on race and ethnicity, the age of the parent. We talked about generations, right? The millennials, yeah. myself included, being already in the 40s. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I mean, I think we, we use a, a pretty standard sample for the kinds of market research that Kantar does. In the back of the report, we have full details on that, and so I would sort of point you to that for all of the details. Um, and you know, I think we use the qualitative research up front to gather some ideas and to sort of get our bearings for designing uh, the quantitative study as well. Um, but I'll, I'll point you to the to the document for kind of full details there. Great. Thanks. Thank I've got one all the way in the back. I'm told. Please. Uh, good morning. My name is Peter Ives. I'm with uh, Public Safety Canada, and we have a team that is helping to combat online child ex exploitation along with other federal departments. Um, maybe I'll just give a small personal example. Um, I have three daughters. Uh, I have a son as well. My 16-year-old daughter was approached about a year ago online. Uh, I came across her laptop by accident, and she was on a site uh, called Omegle, and uh, if you look at Omegle online, it says, the internet is full of cool people. Omegle lets you meet them. When you use Omegle, we pick someone else at random so you can have a one-on-one -on -one chat. And then the exclamation mark, the next line says, talk to strangers. Um, <laughs> as a parent, it's a little shocking. Um, but my question is, 
It's interesting on the statistic, a uh, percentage of children feel safe online and almost 100% of kids are saying that they feel safe online. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to expand the question because if you go out and approach your teenagers and say, hey, how are things going at school today? Is anyone bugging you? Are you being bullied? Most kids will say, hey, dad, I'm fine. Everything's cool. So maybe we need to expand the question. Thank you. Yeah, reactions to that. I, I get the same re response from my own daughter, by the way, a fifth grader. How was school today? Awesome. How was soccer? Great. <laughs> she's a still trap. She's, she's, she lawyers up right away. Um, yeah. Reactions to the, to the gentleman in the back. And that's a, that's a, a harrowing it experience. Is, yeah. yeah, it is. Um, it is a good, good question and I think a good idea. So this is, this is one way to get a read on things. I think one methodology that I would say could be really useful in getting deeper in this is we often do um, triads, right? So getting a few kids together to share some of their experiences and unpack a little bit. So like if we were going to do this again and dive deeper into some of those tensions or challenges, you know, using a qualitative method to sort of get at some of that and that could sharpen the way that we ask some of these questions going forward and maybe get a better read on that. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Just picking up on that one, um, Peter, one of the one of the difficulties with some sites is that they've not looked at it as a positive advantage to actually enable there to be some other features. Whereas you get some sites have decided to flip the narrative and think, how could we build this in from the get-go? So you might want to um, point your daughters or, or, or their peers in contrast. There's some sites which are starting to look at these approaches built in. Ubo is one example, who have an area for 13 to 17s and an area for 18 plus and they differentiate the experience in each of the areas. So there are some sites going this way, um, and I think it's, it's a trend that we might see more of in the future, whereby people actually make a proactive decision to build that in and make it a USP for, for, for that platform. I've got a question right up here from the gentleman with the same haircut as me. Please. <laughs> yeah, we go to the same barber, I guess. Indeed. Um, my name's Ian Corby. I run the Age Verification Providers Association that Judy kindly mentioned earlier. Um, one thing that came through from the research, I think, is a cultural difference I noticed between Europe and America sometimes around the extent of parental discretion. And in particular, we were beginning to talk about parental controls through parents asserting the age of their children in the same breath as talking about age verification and age estimation. I just wondered if that was deliberate because while um, there seems to be more of an attitude here that if your dad said it's okay, it's okay. Some of the legislation that we're seeing now, particularly the California Age Appropriate Design Code Act, isn't going to give you a free pass just because the parents lied about the age. It's going to, you, as a platform, you're going to need to know the age independently. Um, so is, was that blurring the lines and was that deliberate or is it just inadvertent? What do we do about regulations that are asking for more data to be collected? Um, I think that's part of the question. I'll take it however you want, though. I, I think, uh, Ian, what you are pointing out here is a real tension as well in terms of a cultural tension between Europe and the US when it comes to the rights of children versus the rights of parents and families to, to make decisions about, about, uh, about all aspects of their family life, including mm -hmm. online safety. So I think that that is something that I believe there is a panel later on that is going to be exploring this, so I encourage people to attend that panel. But um, uh, the, in transposing some regulations from Europe into the US, I think that there is a bit of jarring because of that very, very basic concept, concept about the best interest of the child maybe being understood in Europe in a way that actually is not quite understood here in the US. So further work needs to be done to make sure that it, the intent of the legislation is preserved, but actually in a way that actually fits the idiosyncrasies of the different countries and the different jurisdictions. And I would say even within the US, the US is vast, so it'll be seen differently in different states. So we just really need to get into that level of granularity. I think we have time for one last question. I think we have a gentleman being handed a mic in the back. 
and then we're going to wrap up. Please. Thanks, Tim. Jack McCartney, um, I'm a friend of FOSI, and I operate a consulting practice that bridges trust, safety, privacy, and security. Uh, my question is sort of two parts. Did the research contemplate any interact, you know, human and non-human interaction? Was that question brought to the parents, and did they address mm -hmm. that? And for the others on the panel, how does your business look at human and non-human activity as you're thinking about this, you know, this use case of identifying the individual? We did not uh, bring that forward to the parents, the, the idea of human and non-human interaction. So I think we're, we're writing down a good list of f further areas to explore. So in terms of um, either IoT or non-person entities such as, say, companies, because we're both an identity and an age platform, we do look at different forms of verification for company or business entities and how you could potentially have different forms of verification in, in an IoT environment. That at the moment has been quite separate from, from our age work, but happy to pick up with you at that over a coffee maybe, Jackie. Um, I don't think there's probably too much more detail I can, I can go into without sort of boring you on different levels of verifiable claims and different elements of company verification. But there's some really interesting work being done on the fraud prevention side around um, companies through the Economic Crime Commission and looking at how if I'm a company director and I set up a plumbing company, I can't nominate Tim and Al Medina and Chris as directors and then Phoenix the next day. So it's a really important topic. Okay. Um, but one probably merits in its own panel. Yes. Um, I, I would just say that w this is not an area that we have explored in, in detail, but uh, we are looking for always to iterate and look for new ways in which we can solve this, this question in the best way that manages that trade-off that we were talking about, about data uh, collection, accuracy, and um, is ease of use. I'm afraid we are out of time. Will you please join me in thanking these fabulous panelists, Cantar for the research, Google for, for funding the research, and Julie for her expertise. Thank you.